Good evening. Good to have you out tonight, and uh, glad that you're able to be with us. And we look forward to hearing from Dr. Matsko here in just a few moments. Uh, but before we do, just a couple of reminders. Uh, there will be a love offering taken after the service. If you weren't able to give this morning, we hope that you can uh, give this evening as well. Uh, ladies' Bible study is this Thursday morning at 10 o'clock. So we hope, ladies, if you are involved in that, you can be here for that. And then our men's prayer time is at 8 o'clock on uh, Saturday morning. And, uh, and uh, if you would sign up for that, that would be greatly appreciated. And uh, also following that, then at 10 o'clock is the ladies' card ministry. And so, uh, ladies, if you are interested in that, there is a sign-up sheet there as well. Uh, also, just to give you a heads up, there is, uh, we are already starting to think about Vacation Bible School. And so there is a, a sign-up sheet uh, to the left uh, where the offering box is. Uh, if you want to pray about a, a place to serve in that, um, uh, you may. Uh, and so we're just kind of getting a, a feel of, of those that will be able to help us for that uh, this summer. So uh, it's looking in June, second week of June, I believe. So uh, be praying about that, and we look forward to uh, seeing what the Lord will do. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer this, this evening and ask God's help and God's blessing on our service. Father, we are so grateful to you for all that you have done. We thank you for your loving kindness. We thank you for your watch care over us. And we thank you that you continue to minister to our hearts day in and day out. Father, we do come confessing our unworthiness and our sinfulness. And we ask for your, your cleansing of our hearts and minds. And as we come approaching your word tonight, Lord, we pray that you would just guide us and speak to us and Lord, just give us understanding that we may know you greater and, and love you more. We pray for Dr. Matskow as he uh, pro proclaims your word, and Lord, that you would just give him uh, the words to speak, the words that will uh, encourage and, and strengthen us in our, our faith and our trust in you. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would uh, be glorified through this service. and. Lord, that uh, we would uh, desire and, and uh, seek to know you greater in our lives as we hear your word. So work in us, we pray, our Father, and we give you the glory, the honor, and the praise, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. My uh, grandchildren had a good time this morning, <laughs> and they want to come back to church, so <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Always glad to see the grandkids coming back. Uh, we're going to start tonight with wonderful words of life. Let's stand together. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see. Wonderful words of life, words of life and beauty, keep me safe and broody. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. Sweetly echo the gospel call, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus, only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, Wonderful words of life, beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful words of life. And now my faith has found a resting. My 
my faith has found a resting place, not in device or creed. I trust the everlasting one, his wounds for me shall plead. I need no other argument, I need no other died and that he died for me. Enough for me that Jesus saves, this ends my fear and doubt. A sinful soul, I come to him, he'll never cast me out. I need no other argument, I need Jesus died, and that he died for me. My heart is leaning on the word, the written word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through his blood. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. We have one more and let the pastor lead this one. I think you may be seated. We'll keep you standing. So this month we have been learning a new song. It's called, Oh God, My Joy. And the words are uh, such a joy uh, as we sing them, uh, reminding us of the greatness of our God. And um, I, I enjoyed our songs this morning. Uh, sing, uh, I sing the mighty power of God, immortal, invisible, God only wise. And then we concluded this morning, give praise to the Lord. And uh, just uh, a reminder to us of the greatness of our God. Uh, where would we be today without God? You know, what kind of shape, what kind of place would we be? But God in his mercy and his grace have, have saved us and has loved us and cared for us and provided for us. And, and so truly, as the Bible teaches us, he alone is worthy of praise. And so I hope that as we we think about this song, and next, next, uh, next month's song is Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, uh, that uh, many of us know, but it's, uh, it's not in our hymn book, so it's one that we don't get to sing very often. Uh, but uh, to just keep looking to, to Jesus, looking unto our great God, and trusting him in our times of need. And I'm not going to preach tonight, that's Brother Matsko's uh, opportunity. But uh, let's sing this tonight, all three verses, O oh God, my joy, and lift our voices unto the Lord. O oh God, my joy, you reign above in radiant splendor and beauty. Your heart had gone, my heart to love the awesome side of your glory your blazing light and gospel grace shine brightly from my savior's face no other wonder would i see than christ enthroned in his glory sustained by joy trial and pain I trust your wisdom and mercy through suffering that your love ordains more like your son you will make me for Christ embrace the cross of shame beholding glorious joys to come oh give me faith see that suffering lifts me to glory compelled by joy i fight the sin that
that turns my gaze from your glory. Your Holy Spirit dwells within. His presence arms me for victory. Let death and hell against me rise. Through death I'll gain eternal joys. All powers of hell will bend the knee my great King of glory. Amen. Brother Matt, go. Okay, well, it's good to be with you again. We got some questions here. So I thought what we'd do is I'd answer some questions first before I do the message tonight. Also have a drawing to do. So we, um, if you know about that, we were doing a drawing for the teenagers as far as the, their um, getting, winning a t-shirt from Bob Jones University. So it's nice to be able to get out free t-shirts. So I'll draw here at random here. Let's see what we got. So Caden Anders is the, is the winner of a t-shirt. Where's Caden? Caden here? Isn't he? Oh, there he is. Okay. Hey, boy, great. Good job. So see my wife afterwards and she'll get you the right size. Okay? Okay. Very good. All right. I'll put these in here. Now I got three questions, written questions, and we might have some time afterwards for some questions from the floor, but let me get these first. Uh, no particular order. So this question says, what about theistic evolution? So theistic evolution has a different God than creation does. Now think about that. So, you know, our God is all-powerful, okay? He doesn't have to work through, you know, you know, sort of trial and error, you know. In fact, you should be thinking, you know, not did God create in six days. You should be, you should be thinking, why did it take him so long? Now, why, you know, why didn't he just, you know, speak the word, and everything was created all at once, you know. Why did he wait? Why did he drag it out over six, you know, twenty-four hour days? That's that's our question. So God's all powerful. God, our God is all wise. So he didn't need again billions of years in trial and error to get it right. I mean, so you're supposed to have these, you know, billions of years of millions of years of the reign of the dinosaurs and so forth, and then they all died out. So what was that all about? <laughs> okay. You know, and so you got all this going on. Again, a lot of evolution by its very nature is trial and error. You know, that's the idea that they had trial and error to get things right. Our God is a God of love. Now, you know, we believe that death and came about as a result of Adam's sin. You remember that Adam and Eve partook of the forbidden fruit and the earth was cursed and then death came upon uh, the creation. Uh, but how do you explain all the death and suffering you know, that occurred for those billions of years before Adam and Eve got there? Okay, we, we've dug up dinosaurs, for example, that have uh, that died of cancer. We can see the cancerous tumors on their, on their bones and so forth. So how do you get a disease like cancer, uh, you know, you know, millions of years before Adam and Eve, you know, were you know, came into existence. And so you have to have some way of explaining uh, where death came from. If, if death, you know, when God, at the end of the creation week, he said everything was very good, okay, uh, was he lying? You know, I mean, was all there, this animal death taking place before Adam and Eve? Was he lying about that or being speaking tongue-in-cheek? I don't think so. And that would make God the author of death, God the author of sin, and rather than um, Adam and Eve. So it puts the weight on God. It, it, it tarnishes his, his character by saying that he's somehow responsible for the, the pickle that we're in as far as the curse is concerned. And then God is a, is a God of grace. So think about this. I mean, you know, the evolution talks about the survival of the fittest, right? Okay, so who was the fittest person that ever lived, ever walked the face of the earth. I'll give you a clue. He could walk on water and he could raise the dead 
Okay? And where do we find him? We find him hanging on a cross, dying for our sins. So that's just the opposite of evolution. According to evolution, he should have survived and all of us should have perished. Okay? But it's just the opposite. You see, theistic evolution has everything exactly upside down. The, the, the one that should have survived died so that we, the unfit, the unworthy, the unlovely, we were the ones who could live. Okay? So the God of theistic evolution is an entirely different God than the God of the Bible. Okay? Any follow-up question to, the, to that? that? That's why I always, where I go with that when people ask me a question like that. Okay. My question is about aliens. Do they exist? Okay. Well, we're, we're led to believe by popular media that, you know, they're going to swoop down on us at any time. And as we become, you know, more and more of a post-Christian society, society, you see those kinds of things become uh, more prevalent in our culture. You know, more UFO sightings and more aliens and that type of thing. When we were in Australia, I would ask the kids, had anybody seen a UFO? And almost every hand would go up. Whereas if I did the same thing in America, um, very few hands went up. And so you could see the difference as far as where we were as far as Christian culture was concerned. So how do I know they're not aliens? Well, I went to a, a speech by Do Charlie Duke. Charlie Duke's an astronaut from South Carolina, and he went to the moon on one of the moon missions. And interesting story, you should read his book sometimes, called Moonwalker. And he talks about how he got saved after he went to the moon. And really interesting, that story. But somebody in the audience said, do you believe in aliens? And he, just like that, he said, do you mean angels? And of course, they never mean angels. <laughs> they always mean little green men. Okay. But I always thought that was a good way of answering that. But the distances in the universe are so great. I just looked it up uh, this afternoon. So the fastest theoretical spacecraft, not the, sp not the ones that we actually have, but the ones that, they, that, that are theoretically possible, um, how long would it take to get to the nearest star, which is Proxima Centauri, about you know, 4.5 light years away? It would take 81,000 years to get there. And that doesn't account stopping. <laughs> you know, get right by it. You'd have to figure out some way to stop if you're going to go there. So the, the, the distances in the universe are so vast, we just don't have a sense of how large they are that it's like the great gulf fixed between heaven and hell. You know, there's a, there, it, nobody can go between one and the other. It's just too large of a distance for that to take place. So what are these things that people see and these stories about being abducted and so forth? I believe that they're all cult in nature, okay? That these are s satanic manifestations. And that's why you see more of these kinds of things in non-Christian societies, more of these kinds of sightings and that kind of thing. So I have a whole message on this that I don't get to preach on very often, so I'm not going to preach it now. But if you want to know more about that later, I'd be happy to talk to you. Okay. Um, next one is, how do you explain the age of the earth to an evolutionist? So we're talking about an impossible task, all right? Uh, we're talking about a matter of faith. Uh, they believe in evolution because that is their faith. That's what they believe. That's their religion, if you want to put it that way. And so they're not amenable to, you know, to evidence, usually. Let me give you an example. So in 2005, there was a, they found a, almost a complete Tyrannosaurus rex uh, fossil in Montana. And they were in a hurry to get it because it's worth a lot of money. They're afraid that it would be sold in the black market, that type of thing. So this man commissioned one of those old uh, Huey helicopters, uh, Vietnam vintage, and went to um, Montana to pick it up. And while he was there, it's supposed to be 60 some 62 million years old okay so when they picked it up they couldn't get the big femur bone through the through the door and so they did what any normal person would do they broke it in half in order to get it and when they did that it had the smell of death the man said he had worked in the bosnian killing fields he knew what death smelled like and he said it had the smell of death and it had a lot of spongy stuff in on the inside of the bone 
So they sent it to Mary uh, uh, um, Schweitzer, in, who's a professor in uh, NC State, and she dissolved all the mineral, all the stuff that was turned to mineral, and she got this spongy stuff, and uh, it looks for all the world like sinews and corpuscles and the arteries and that kind of thing. You can see pictures online. So what was their conclusion? You know, we would say, well, look, it's impossible that this dinosaur is 65 million years old because there's no way that soft material could last for 65 million years. It's being cooked by radiation from coming in from up in the Earth, you know, like radioactive materials, and it's being cooked by cosmic rays coming down on the Earth. And there's no way it can survive for more than thousands of years. Uh, but that, that wasn't their conclusion. They said, look, isn't it amazing that soft tissue can last for 65 million years? Okay, so there's always a rescue me mechanism. Now, poor Mary Schweitzer, um, she's, she's spending the rest of her life trying to do experiments to try to figure out how soft material could last for 65 million years, okay? And it's a waste of, of a good mind, as far as I'm concerned, okay? So we're not talking, you know, there's no, everybody wants to know, is there a killer argument I can use? You know, I give this argument, everybody gets on their knees and says, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. It doesn't work like that. Say, the Bible says that, that we have to live by faith, okay? Without faith, it's impossible to please him, okay? And so there's no killer argument. There's no argument I can give you where you're going to persuade your neighbor or coworker or whatever who's an evolutionist. So what you, should you be doing for them? You should be praying for them and asking the Holy Spirit to turn their stony hearts into fleshly hearts that can absorb the truth. Okay, that's what you have to do. It's a spiritually discerned type of thing. Any follow-up on that? What's that? Well, three areas of, of conversation I talk about is, uh, number one, uh, irreducible complexity, the idea that um, you know, we see a lot of complex structures, like the blood clotting mechanism in the body has a different, about 100 different complex steps and if any one of them is wrong, then eat all your blood will either clot completely and you die, or you bleed out and you die. And so there's all these complex mechanisms, especially in the biological world, that point to a designer. Okay, so that's one one thing. Next is the cause and effect. Is there any more important basic law in science than cause and effect? And the Effect is always, the effect is always less than the cause. Cause is always greater than the effect. So if the effect is the universe, then the cause must be something greater than the universe, of course, which is God. And the third area of discussion I talk about is the idea that the universe is winding down. You know, what we talk about the second law of thermodynamics. Everybody sort of gets that. You know, you buy a house here, you know, near the, near the ocean, and, and so the sea breeze comes, all that nice salt air, and it, it rusts everything and, and turns all your rebar and your concrete into, into rust and breaks the concrete up. And, you know, and there's all this maintenance you have to do. You all know about the maintenance and so forth. So we know that things go downhill all on their own. People get that. So those are three areas. The universe is not getting better. It's, it's, it's winding down. They can get that. So those are three areas I talk about. But again, they're not going to accept it unless, um, you know, there's a miracle that takes place. And they're, they're able to accept the, the truth because this is an article of faith with them. Um, you can't have evolution without a long period of time it ju you know, because it has to be this trial and error type of thing that goes on. Okay. All right. Well, well maybe we'll have some time for questions at the end here. I'd like to talk to you about scientific foreknowledge tonight. So one of the questions often asked of the Bible is how do we know that it's inspired by God? One answer is the unity of the book, written by 40-plus authors over a 1,500-year period. Another answer is the hundreds of prophecies that have already come to pass. However, a third area lies in this area of scientific foreknowledge. That is, scientific information that was revealed in the Bible long before mankind discovered or verified it through extra-biblical means. So let's ask the Lord's help here so I can, we can all be on the same page here and the Lord can help us understand. Father, we thank you that we can be here at church this evening and to worship you. 
thank you, Lord, that you are the great creator God. We thank you there are answers to these questions that people have and that science uh, points towards you very clearly for those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. We pray for those we're, we love and we're concerned about, our neighbors and friends who are, who are lost in error and who are blinded by Satan. We pray, Father, that you'll take the, the veil from their faces and allow them to see clearly um, the truth of God's word. For Jesus' sake we pray, amen. We have to be careful with this topic because it's easy to uh, be involved in wishful thinking, to try to uh, twist scripture into meaning something, having a modern meaning that it doesn't have. And so let me give you an example of that. Uh, for example, Revelation 11, 9 says, And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half. It's talking about the time in the future in Revelation where there's a two witnesses and the Antichrist kills them and they lay their bodies lay in the streets of Jerusalem uh, for three days. And it's, you know, something that hasn't happened yet, going to happen in the future. And it says, they, the people and kindreds and tongues and nations, shall see their dead bodies three days and a half. Well, people said, well, see, that's obviously television, satellite television. You know, people all over the world are watching their televisions or looking at the Internet or whatever, and they see this event and so forth. Well, maybe. Uh, but on the other hand, it uses very similar language for, Pen for Pentecost. Uh, it says the same thing, that there are people of different tribes and kindreds and peoples and so forth in Jerusalem when Peter gave his sermon. It's not saying that everybody was there. It's just saying there were representative people from all over the world at, in Jerusalem on that particular day. So to, to say that this means there has to be satellite television or whatever is, uh, I think, stretching things a good bit further than we need to. So we need to be careful about that. Here's another one. The Bible, remarkably for its time, notes that the eighth day after birth is the safest time to perform circumcisions. When a baby is born, they have no bacteria in their intestines for the first few days. By the seventh day, the bacteria multiply and produce vitamin K. Without vitamin K and prothrombin protein, which is produced by the liver using vitamin K, the blood will not clot properly, and the possibility of severe bleeding as well as infection would make circumcision dangerous in a primitive medical situation. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. That's all true, okay? But ancient people weren't stupid either. I mean, there's, this is something you could figure out by trial and error. Hey, let's try circumcision the second day. Well, that didn't work very well. Okay, third day, fourth day. So just by trial and error, you find out the eighth day is the best day. Then you write it down in your holy book and so forth. And so, um, you know, this is something that, that, now I don't believe that. I believe, of course, this was inspired by God, but it's something that, that uh, people could say, well, that's just trial and error. The ancient people figured it out just by, uh, you know, doing it wrong the first number of times. Well, these days, if somebody wants to be circumcised, they give the baby a, a shot of vitamin K the first day, and, and they can take care of it right away. So it's not a, not a problem in our situation. Well, I'm going to give you five examples. There's lots of these examples. I talked about one this morning. I'll give you five examples of scientific foreknowledge in the Bible. These are my top five choice, choices, and I chose them because I like them. And since I'm speaking, I get to choose. You don't, and you don't, okay? So I chose the ones I like. Okay, the first one is, it comes from Genesis 15.5. Genesis 15.5. And it is, the stars are too great in number to count. The stars are too great in number to count. So Genesis 15.5, uh, God takes Abraham out, and he says, tell the stars, or we would say, count the stars, he says, and he brought him forth and says, now look toward heaven, tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, so shall thy seed be. Also we see in Hebrews eleven twelve it says, therefore sprang there even as one and him as good as dead. So many as the stars in the sky for multitude as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Well, I think Abraham probably had a good idea of how many sand, how much sand there was on the seashore. Got a lot, okay. But how many stars could he see? I mean, really. I mean, with your, we, we don't have telescopes here. He doesn't have a telescope. 
So he's looking up, how many stars could you see with, if there's no light pollution, just with your naked eyes? Well, probably at one time, you know, about 3,000. If you waited all night for the stars to pass, maybe you'd get five or 6,000, okay? And I can see Abraham say, well, that's nice, God, but that's nowhere near to the number of sands on the seashore, okay? Uh, of course, what did, what did Abraham do? What does the Bible tell us? Well, it tells us Abraham believed anyway, right? Uh, even though he couldn't see stars without number, uh, he was a man of faith. He was a father of the faithful, and he believed what, what God told him. How many stars are there? Well, I used to tell people that there were 100 billion stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way, and 100 billion galaxies that we could see with our telescopes. But I mainly said that because it was easy to remember the same number. Okay. But really, the last estimate I saw is there's 300 billion stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way, and there are 2 trillion galaxies that we can see with our telescopes. And that doesn't count all the stars we can't see beyond where we can see. So how many sands or grains of sand are there on the seashore? I don't know. I saw, saw some guy on the internet try to estimate that and came out to the same number as the stars and all that and so forth. That's not the point. The point is, is that the, the Bible, uh, this ancient text, of course, inspired by the Holy Spirit, tells us that the stars were without number. You know, there's a... There's a lot of promises in the Bible that we need to believe uh, because God said it, not because we can prove it, not because we can see it with our eyes, but because of faith. First, you know, somebody counted there's 300, excuse me, 3,573 promises in the Bible. I didn't count them myself, that's what he said. So the first one is Genesis 3.15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. That's a promise fulfilled by Christ on the cross for us. Last promise is Revelation 22.20. He who testifies these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Now, you know, I've been alive almost these 70 years now. And he hasn't come yet. Okay, should I give up on that promise? No, uh, he could come tonight. Do you believe he could come tonight? I do. Okay, I could, he could come before I, before I stop speaking. Okay, and so uh, we still believe those things, we, even though we haven't seen them with our own eyes. So look for those promises and, and do what day Abraham did. Um, you know, trust God, have faith in what he says, because those are promises that apply to you. They're promises for us that know the Lord. Okay, number two, the universe has expanded from its original size. The universe has expanded from its original size. Now, there's, there's lots of verses about this. Actually, I counted 17 verses in seven books of the Bible about this. Let me give you some examples, all right? Uh, Psalm 104, verse 2. Who covereth thyself with light as with a garment, who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain. Isaiah 42, 5. Thus saith the Lord God that created the heavens and stretched them out. Jeremiah 10, verse 12. He hath made the earth by his power, he hath established the world by his wisdom, and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Zechariah 12, 1. The bird of the Lord, word of the Lord for Israel saith the Lord that stretcheth forth the heavens and lays the foundation of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. So this idea about the heavens being stretched out, the uh, first glimmer we had it, of it in this modern scientific era was in the 1920s, when Edwin Hubble uh, combined the Doppler shift measurements of radio velocities with distance measurements to conclude that all the galaxies were rushing away from our galaxy, the Milky Way. And not only is that you know, the further away they are from us, the faster they're moving away from us. And not only that, they're moving away faster and faster and faster, accelerating. They're accelerating to such an extent uh, that the secular scientists are concerned about what they call the big rip, that the whole fabric of space-time will rip apart, and that'll be the end of the world. And it's interesting, if you look in the Bible, when it, these verses, these 17 verses, it uses past tense, that God stretched forth the heavens. 
And uh, so that may be an explanation for how did the light get here from the stars. In other words, you have the sun, moon, and stars are created on day four, and almost immediately the light's there, and yet those stars could be you know, billions of light years away. So one of the ideas is that the universe is created in a relatively small area, maybe like two light years across or something, and then God expanded it on the surface of a white hole at relativistic speeds, and so time in deep space is not the same as time here on the Earth. And the Earth and Bible's written from the standpoint of the Earth, not, not in deep space and so forth. And that would explain how the light got here from the stars. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't have a way of proving it, but it certainly coincides what we see about the Bible saying he stretched forth the heavens. And it also says present tense, that he's stretching forth the heavens, which reminds us that God's at work in our lives today, in our world today. He's not, you know, sitting in a rocking chair and not paying any attention. Okay, he's actually actively involved in the world that we live in. That's a good thing to know when you're involved in prayer, right? And then it talks about he will stretch forth the heavens in the future. Okay, so this is going to continue until he's, he's through with this old heavens and uh, he has to destroy it and create a new heavens, a new earth. So you don't have to worry about the, the big rip, okay? That's not the way. The Bible tells us that the earth is going to be dissolved in a big noise, okay? It's, it's going to be destroyed, um, you know, by fire, and the, and the atoms themselves are going to come loose and, and be dissolved and so forth, and God's going to make a new heavens and new earth. You know, it takes... Um, a lot of faith to believe in some of these secular scientific ideas. I had a, I was speaking in an Arabic church through a translator in Sydney, Australia, and a man came up afterwards. He was a Palestinian uh, trained in Cuba in engineering. He said, I don't have enough faith to believe, you know, in a creator God. I said, well, do you believe in dark matter? Uh, they call it dark because we don't know what it is, okay? And he said, yeah, that makes about 27% of the world, of the universe. I said, do you believe in dark energy? That's their explanation for this, ex this acceleration, that the dark energy is pushing everything away, but they don't know what it is. They call it dark because they have no knowledge of what it is. So that's about 68%. So I said, you think then that all the stuff we can see, okay, all the matter we can see only makes up four or five percent of the universe. And he said, yeah, that's right. I said, well, faith is not your problem. You have plenty of faith, okay? No. <laughs> so it wasn't a matter of faith. And praise the Lord, um, some months later we heard that he had a, was the last member of his extended family to trust Christ. So the Lord saved that, that man. All right. Second Peter 3, verse 10 tells us how it's all going to end. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works of therein, shall be burned up. Okay, so that's how it will end. Number three, the earth is suspended in space. Job 26.7, he stretched out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. In his commentary, Ellicott says, here we find Job more than 3,000 years ago describing the language, of scientific in the language of scientific accuracy, the condition of our globe, and holding it forth as a proof of divine power. And it's especially remarkable because ancient people didn't think that way. There was nobody in the ancient world that thought the earth was hanging on nothing. If you ask them, they'd say, you know, even in Hindu uh, faith these days, they talk about the cosmic turtle, okay? So you say, what's the earth sitting on? They'd say, well, on the, on the turtle, you know? And so what's that turtle standing on? Well, it's standing on a bigger turtle, okay? And what's that turtle standing on? A bigger turtle still. You know, it's turtles all the way down, okay? That's their idea. So nobody in the ancient world thought about the earth hanging on nothing. That is a modern scientific idea. So even in the 19th century in our country, there were two physicists named Michelson and Morley at the Cleveland Institute, and they had this great idea. Remember this morning I said how the Earth is going around the sun at 66,600 miles per hour? Okay, so we're moving pretty fast, th fast through space. So they thought, well, we'll measure the speed of light in the direction of the motion of the Earth, 
and then we'll measure it perpendicular to the motion of the Earth, and we should be able to tell something about what, this, what space is made of. They called it back then the luminiferous ether. That was what they thought was in space, this kind of goo that the Earth was embedded in, like jello or something like that. And so he was, they were trying to figure out what a, about this, this goo. Their whole lives, they tried did these experiments, and they never could get any difference in the speed of light each direction, okay? Because they didn't understand about relativity and Einstein, he came later, and, all right? But the idea that scientists at the end of the 19th century still had this idea that the Earth was embedded in something, okay? And of course, later we, of course, now we know, we have, we have the right idea that the Earth is actually hung on nothing, as the Bible says. All right, let's, what else do we have? So, num oh, I like this, what Matthew Henry said. His, Matthew Henry in his commentary said this, and I think it's very profound, and I enjoy reading his elegant words. He says, the globe by the mighty, almighty power of God is firmly fixed in its place, poised with its own weight. The art of man cannot hang a feather upon nothing, yet the divine wisdom hangs the whole earth so. It is upheld by the word of God's power. What is hung upon nothing may serve us to set our feet on and bear the weight of our bodies, but it will never serve us to set our hearts on nor bear the weight of our souls. Okay? So if you understand that a man's soul is weightier uh, than the whole earth, you get the idea that he's trying to get across here. It's very profound. Anyway, next one, number four. Uh, the blood sustains life. Leviticus 17, 11. The blood sustains life, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. The practice of bloodletting. You know what bloodletting is? It's when they used to remove the blood from a person in order to restore their health. It seemed logical when the foundation of all medical treatment was based on the four body humors, blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. So health was sought to be restored by purging, starving, vomiting or bloodletting. Of course, now in our modern scientific area, we understand that, month, month, that health is restored by extracting money from our wallets. <laughs> okay, that's the, the, the proper way, okay. So the art of bloodletting was flourishing well before Hippocrates in the fifth century BC. Uh, by the Middle Ages, both surgeons and barbers were specializing in this bloody practice. So you've seen a barber pole, okay? That's because they used to let blood. So the red stands for the blood, the white's for the tourniquet, the pole itself, the, like the stick the patient would hold on to uh, to dilate the veins. Bloodletting came to the United States on the Mayflower, reached unbelievable heights in the 18th and early 19th century. Our first president, George Washington, died from a throat infection in 1799 after being drained of 40% or five pints of his blood within 24 hours. We dispatched the father of our country, okay, because we didn't believe what the Bible says about the life of the flesh is in the blood. It wasn't until the end of the 19th century that phlebotomy was declared to be quackery. Well, you know, the value of the life is a measure of the value of the blood. This gives the blood of Christ, its inconceivable value. When it was shed, the sinless God-man gave his life. It's not the blood in the veins of the sacrifice, but the blood shed that's effective. Scripture knows nothing of salvation by imitation or influence of Christ's life, but only by that life yielded up on the cross. And then finally, thermodynamics. We talked about that a little bit uh, in the question time. That's the idea of entropy, the idea that the universe is running down. So Hebrews 1, 10, and 13, 10 through 11, Hebrews 1, says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They shall all wax old as doth a garment. As a vesture, thou shalt fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. So the first formulation of the second law of thermodynamics didn't come until 1850 by Rudolf Clausius. The idea that the energy level of the universe is running down, energy going from higher levels to lower levels, from higher temperatures to lower temperatures, from usable forms to unusable forms, never in the opposite direction. So 
So this is what we call the second law of thermodynamics in physics and chemistry and engineering. The universe is going toward heat death, where the heat would become unusable to do any work. So years ago, I taught uh, thermodynamics um, for, I taught maybe about 25 years, and I thought, you know, the same God who made the laws of science, the laws of thermodynamics, made the spiritual laws that govern my life in this world. What can I learn spiritually uh, about the laws of thermodynamics? How can I apply them to my life? So I wrote these down. Let this be a testimony, my testimony to you. I wrote years ago. Number one, I said the earth and all material things on it are temporary. A lot of verses about that in the Bible. And therefore, I said, I will not live for material things. Those things are all passing away. Number two, the only things that can escape the second law, according to the Bible, are God. I have verses for all these. Salvation, God's word, and God's people. God, salvation, God's word, and God's people. Therefore, I will make these things the center of my life. Bob Jones Sr., who's, who founded Bob Jones University in 1927, when he was a boy in southeast Alabama, probably 11 years old, as far as we can tell, he realized that that day he would have to live somewhere forever, and it changed his life. So we sing that song, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. Do you really believe that? Okay. So if you believe that, let's have a reunion. Okay, so 10,000 years from today, okay, all of us in this room, let's get together and have a reunion and talk about all the wonderful things that God has done since today and until that time 10,000 years from now. You say, well, where are we going to meet? I say, well, I don't know. I don't know the geography, the new heavens and new earth, but I'm sure their GPSs work better than ours do, okay? <laughs> so don't worry about that. We'll get together somehow. But So let's have a reunion 10,000 years from now because uh, if you believe that, we really are going to be somewhere 10,000 years from now. And then I wrote, energy uh, for living must flow from a higher source. I put Zechariah chapter 4. You remember Zechariah chapter 4? It's a system of bowls and pipes, and the oil flows down from heaven through these pipes and bowls to Joshua, who's the secular authority, and to, excuse me, Joshua, who's the high priest, and to Zerubbabel, who's the secular authority, and then it says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Would you like to uh, backslide? I can tell you how to backslide. Okay, No matter how strong you are spiritually now, it doesn't matter whether you're a Sunday school teacher or a pastor, you know, you know, a deacon in this church or whatever, if you want to backslide, just cut yourself off from the energy from above. Okay, So don't pray. Okay, Don't read your Bible. And don't meet with other Christians. And I can guarantee it will not take any time at all before uh, people will not even recognize you as a Christian. Do you know people like that? Do you know people that maybe were pastors or Sunday school superintendents and so forth? If you talk to them today, you wouldn't even know that they were saved. It's like they've forgotten everything they knew. We think that that knowledge we have of God belongs to us, but he can remove it from us any time that he wants to because we're not faithful to him. And then I put, life on earth is, on earth is short and youth is fleeting. Therefore, I must use my time wisely. Now, maybe you think, maybe especially young people think they can achieve something that will win you eternal fame on earth. Okay. Well, all of you have eight great-grandparents. So could you sit down with a piece of paper and write their names, first, middle, and last of all your, of your eight great-grandparents, okay? And tell me what their hopes and ambitions and dreams are. Tell me about their accomplishments. What did your eight great-grandparents accomplish in their lives? How many of us could do that? You're related to them, you ungrateful wretches, okay? <laughs> okay. And the same thing is going to happen to us. We live, we die, and even in our own families, uh, we're forgotten. But what's done for Christ will last. Christ's memory is not subject to the second law of thermodynamics. Okay? And that should be an encouragement to you. So I wrote, the world's not getting any better. 
Second law, I don't have to give you the verses for that, you know, 2 Timothy 3. The second law predicts an increase in sin and disorder in the world. And I wrote, therefore, I will not live my life as a part of the world system. I, not, and I will not wear its clothes. I will not listen to its music. I will not enjoy its entertainment. I will not bow down to its fashion or in styles or worship its educational system. So the conclusion is that the Bible is not a science textbook, but when the Bible speaks about science, it's extremely accurate. But there's still some things, there's scientific things in the Bible that we don't understand. And when I encounter those, I try to do like Abraham. I try to believe. I try to have faith. And I say, yes, someday science may catch up to what the Bible is saying. That science still lags behind the scientific things we read in God's word. So let's just believe the Bible, believe the promises, and wait for science to catch up. Okay? Okay, so that's what I have tonight. And uh, so do we have any other questions from the floor? Do I have until 7? Is that there? Okay. Okay. So do we have any other questions from the floor? Anything about what we've talked about tonight? I've gone kind of fast just to give time for questions. Yes. 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 Yeah, I, I, that's a good question. I mean, obviously, if we're immersed in God's word ourselves, the Bible's going to flow from us naturally. I think about it like this, okay? So you have this brick wall that represents their resistance to the gospel and so forth, and there's a great light shining behind it, okay? But there's places in the wall where we can see that the, the mortar's been pushed out, it been, you know, and you can start seeing some light shining through the cracks, okay? And maybe that was a re some kind of reverse in their life. They lost a loved one or... You know, they're, they're divorced or, you know, they've, they've had a financial, you know, reversal or whatever, you know, something in their life. They're, you know, have illness or whatever it is. And uh, so our job is then, as we talk to them, to try to poke at it, <laughs> okay? To just poke at it, try to poke some more of that mortar out, okay? And not only the Holy Spirit can cause the whole, whole wall to fall down, but I just feel my job is just to poke at it. And that, that may be with the words of Scripture, or it may be just with our own words, hopefully, that are informed by Scripture, you know, that are in our hearts. That we can poke at those things. And eventually, if you poke and get enough mortar out, the wall is going to collapse, and the light of the gospel will shine into their life. Anyway, that's why I visualize this, this idea. Are not going to be discouraged? No, no. No, I mean, how many times does it take to... You know, for a person to come to Christ. I've seen surveys where they said that it's like the, it takes like seven presentations of the gospel before a person accepts. And you don't know where you are on the, on the chain, right? You don't know if you're the first one or you're the last one. And of course, if you're the last one, then you have the joy of, of leading that person to Christ. But you may be the third one or the fourth one. So I have a, I have a colleague, uh, Jim Roach, who taught physics with me at Bob Jones for many years. And he came from a very Catholic family. All his, his brothers and sisters were priests and nuns. And he got his PhD in electrical engineering up at the University of Rochester. And he was hard drinking. His marriage was on the rocks. And people kept witnessing to him, giving him tracks. He'd pull them up and throw them away, you know. And, and one day he came in and he took one of the tracks somebody gave to him and put it up on his refrigerator you know how the tops of refrigerators are, they gather dust? Well, he hit a low point in his life, and he saw that thing up there, and he read it, and he got saved. He didn't even remember who gave it to him. And when he got saved, and his wife got saved, and the first thing they did was they poured all the liquor down the, the drain. <laughs> you know, they really got really saved. And then he came to teach at Bob Jones all those years. But you just don't know. You just don't know how the Lord's going to use that word or that tract you know, if you're just 
thinking about yourself and thinking about, you know, they rejected me or, you know, I feel bad about this or whatever. You don't think about, you know, you're just one of a long chain of people and events that are taking place in your life. I think that's the way to think about it. Um, anything else? Yes. Yes. Well, you can't carbon date a rock. Oh, I'm oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you. So the question was about carbon dating, okay? And so people say that, you know, things are millions of years old or billions of years because of carbon dating. So number one, if they're talking about billions of years, they're not talking about carbon dating, okay? Carbon dating is only good for things that have carbon in them, like, like, like wood or bones or those, those kinds of things, okay? But the principle is kind of the same. Okay, so they're making assumptions when they do carbon dating. Number one, they're assuming that they know how much of the parent element was there, say uranium. How much uranium was in that rock to start with? Well, they don't know that. Okay. Then they're making an assumption that they know how much daughter element was in that rock to start with, like lead. They don't know that either. Okay. Then they're assuming that nothing washed in or out. The uranium didn't wash out, or the lead didn't wash in, and so forth. They don't know that either. They don't know what's happened to that rock in the meantime. Then they're assuming that the rate of radioactive decay is the same throughout all of history. Well, how long have we known about radioactive decay? Pierre and Marie Curie, right? Okay, so we're what? We're talking about 100 years? Okay, so. So what do we know about radioactive decay rates 200 years ago, or 1,000 years ago, or 4,000 years ago? Nothing. We don't have any knowledge about that. And we do have evidence. If you ever look at a piece of granite, you'll see those black flecks in the granite? That, that's called biotite mica. And inside the biotite mica, there's little gemstones called zircons, just microscopic. Inside the zircons, there are sometimes uranium atoms that we can see in there. And when they, 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 um, they um, decay, they go <coughs> like this, and they make a fission track that we can actually see with a microscope. Sometimes you can see them in your diamonds, ladies, if you get a microscope and look at your diamond, and you can see the fission track where a uranium atom actually decayed inside your diamond, okay? But when it does that, it makes a chemical called helium. Okay. It releases an alpha particle, the alpha particle picks up, picks up electrons, and that's a helium atom there. And we know a lot about how long it takes helium atoms to escape from zircons at certain temperatures and pressures. And so those dates, because the helium's still trapped in the zircon, we know that that zircon has to be only thousands of years old. It can't be millions and billions of years old. So which date is right? the date based on the uniform decay of uranium or the one based on the helium decay rates? And the answer is that always the youngest age has to be the right one. Logically, the youngest one has to be right. So I would say radioactive decay actually proves the young age of the Earth. Now talking about carbon dating in particular, okay, so you have, you ladies have diamonds on, those diamonds are made of carbon. Now those diamonds are supposed to be two billion years old. Okay. All the new carbon, the carbon, uh, the carbon 14, should have decayed uh, in, we shouldn't be able to detect any of it in uh, 100,000 years. 100,000 years, it's all gone. Okay. But we still find carbon 14 in your diamonds. How did it get in there? Well, the secular scientists say well, it's contamination. It's really hard to contaminate a diamond. They're really hard, okay? It's hard to get things in those, in those little diamonds, all right? So I would show my students, I taught analytical chemistry, and I'd show them the uh, accelerated mass spectrometers they use to do radiocarbon dating. And I'd show them the carbon-14 in the reference sample. And I said, there's no reference samples they have, deep well carbon dioxide, coal, diamonds, that don't have new carbon in them, carbon-14. And they say, well, look, you can see that it's young. What do they say about that? Well, remember, it's a matter of faith. We're not talking about science here. I say they take the dial and they turn it. They zero it out <coughs> like that. My students would go, really? 
That's what they do? Yeah, that's really what they do. Because they know it's not there. It must be contamination because new carbon can't be in diamonds or coal or whatever because they're too old based on the evolutionary dating that they know is true. So they just zero it out and it's gone. Very simple. My students are always appalled to hear such things, but it certainly is true. And so, yes, so the fact that there is carbon, new carbon, carbon-14 in diamonds, in coal, in every other source of carbon we have on the face of the earth shows that the earth is thousands of years old and not millions and billions of years old. So carbon dating proves the young age of the earth. That's the short answer. Anything else? Okay, everybody's stunned. <laughs> They're stunned, all right. <laughs> all right, so thank you so much. Pastor, would you like to close the service for us? Uh, no, honey, I'm not talking about yours. No. <laughs> so, no. We're glad that uh, we're so thankful that the Lord has enabled us to have the Matskos and uh, just the information that um, that we've been able to to glean and and the encouragement. Um, what a great God! Again, uh, I just I just kind of like Mark there. You know when you begin to think the greatness of our God, and it's, it's uh, just amazing. And so I, I trust that we'll, we'll leave here with a greater awe of who he is and all that he has done in his creation and, and in us, and just rejoice in, in his greatness and trust him even more. Let's stand. We'll have a word of prayer, and um, uh, we'll ask the, the Matskos if they want to go ahead and head out to the back there. That way they can talk and answer any other questions that uh, you may have uh, also the love offering is will be out there as well and um, and so we hope that uh, you'll be able to give for that as well gracious father again we we thank you for just the thy word and uh, we are in awe of all that you have done uh, lord you tell us all scripture is given by inspiration of god and is profitable for doctrine for reproof for correction and instruction in righteousness and lord we just thank you that you reveal yourself you reveal your greatness to us through your word uh, all your word and we just pray that you will help us to to cling to it to to uh, live it and to love it with our lives and lord that uh, through what we do and say that you will be glorified and magnified and so, Father, we just pray that you will help us as we go our separate ways tonight, Lord. As we enter into a new week, Lord, help us to be aware of divine appointments that you may set before us, that we may share the truth of your word with others. And, Lord, we just pray that, uh, that you will help us to have boldness to give the gospel through this week to share with others and uh, to see those who may come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, we pray that you will just uh, continue to work in us, continue to grow us, and uh, Lord, we ask that you would just uh, help us to uh, live for you this day. And we praise you for all that, all that you've done. We ask these things in